under such auspicious conditions, uh, with such an auspicious uh, context setting. Time is short, I'll get right to it. Here's my title, and we're off. After a lifetime of studying religions in all their particularity, Wilfred Smith, the founder of the Harvard Center for the Study of Comparative Religion, came to see them as evidence of a single planetary spiritual heritage. Our new task, he said, is to interpret the cosmic significance of human life generically. I think I can safely say that this is a sentiment widely shared by people in this room. Unfortunately, what I can get away with at the dawn of interspirituality, I can never get away with it at work. Most of my academic colleagues do not share the assumption of an ultimate spiritual reality, the culturally varied response to which are humankind's religions. So trying to begin with that assumption gets me nowhere. So I beg your indulgence this morning to let me pretend that I am preaching not to you, but to the unconverted, and that to make headway on the question of our spiritual unity, I must start with as much scientific consensus as I can and work inward from there. The scientific consensus I have in mind has come clearly into view only in the last 50 years by an astonishing synthesis of findings from all branches of modern science. It tells a coherent story of the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago to the present. Some people call this story Big History, and these are three of the leading works in the field. They've taught me a great deal, but to my great disappointment, these books ignore almost completely the history of human spirituality over the last 40,000 years. <coughs> So when I was invited to give a paper at the recent International Big History Conference where the authors of these books would be present, I decided to give them a piece of my mind, using their own data to argue for the saliency of the question of spiritual unity. So I begin with three of the biggest lessons that Big History has taught all of us, though I must, of course, state these lessons with ridiculous brevity. Because we are all children of the Big Bang, by the way, now sometimes called the Great Radiance, uh, there is a profound cosmological sense in which we are one. As, as Eric Chasen suggests, hydrogen is a gas which over time changes into people. Or as Carl Sagan famously put it, uh, we're all stardust. Secondly, because the 110 billion human beings who have ever been alive have been so on this nano island in the cosmic sea. This, by the way, instead of showing you the normal whole Earth from the moon, this is a shot taken from Voyager 1 in the vicinity of Saturn, looking back on Earth, this moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. This is home to all of us all of us who have ever been here. And there is therefore a deep terrestrial sense in which we are one. We are all very profoundly Earth beings. Thirdly, because the human genome contains over three billion chemical nucleotide bases, and that on the order of 99.9% .9 of them are exactly the same in all people, there is a deep biological sense in which we are one. I rush on now to a fourth major scientific lesson about unity that has so far escaped the concern of the big historians. I will call it the psychological sense in which we are one, a, a, a fact derived from uh, a, a stipulation derived from the fact of cultural universals. Harvard Stephen Pinker has written that the new sciences of human nature expose the psychological unity of our species beneath the superficial differences of physical appearance and parochial culture. Anthropologists have now confirmed, beyond reasonable doubt, the existence of a wide array of basic psychological adaptations to life 
that characterize every Homo sapiens culture known to history and ethnography. This is stunning. This is headline news because a mere 40 years ago, a ranking academic panel declared, and I quote, human universals are no more likely than bird shit in a cuckoo clock. <laughs> How did we get from that statement to the current facts? What led to this stunning reversal of opinion? The key figure is Donald Brown, Emeritus Professor of Anthropology at UC Santa Barbara. Earlier in his career, he accepted the common assumption that there were no cultural universals, nor anything we could call, confidently call, human nature. But one day, Brown met a colleague who was arguing for a particular behavioral universal that he, Brown, could refute him. Brown tried and failed. After making another similar bet and losing that one too, Brown got curious about how long the list of cultural universals really was. When Brown restudied the literature, he found that human universals had been a persistent, if recessive, theme throughout the 20th century. A key moment in that century was G.P. Murdoch's 1945 list of 72 of them, a list which was still au courant and approvingly cited in E. O. Wilson's highly influential on human nature three decades later. In his own 1991 book, Human Universals, Brown published evidence for 311 cultural universals. He then re-summarized his findings in a 1999 essay in the MIT Encyclopedia of the Cognitive Sciences, and in 2002, Steven Pinker's The Blank Slate, his own case for universal human nature, dedicated an appendix to Brown's list, adding 56 new ones for a total of 367. It's worth just a minute to give you all a brief, a brief taste of these cultural universals. Members of every Homo sapiens cult, there's going to be a lot of words here, but you can just listen to the music. Members of every Homo sapiens culture known to history and ethnography adorn their bodies, style their hair, and like sweets. <laughs> they engage in gift giving and hospitality. They experience empathy and feel affection. Many human facial expressions are universal and elicit the same emotional responses everywhere. Members of every Homo sapiens culture known to history and ethnography use language as their principal medium of communication. And all languages have the same deep architecture, built of the same basic units and arranged according to implicit rules of grammar. They, reckon they have poetry and use metaphor and apply aesthetic standards. They reckon time, distinguish past, present, and future, and strive to predict the future especially the weather. For homo, uh, every homo sapiens culture known to history and ethnography uses logic, makes binary cognitive distinctions, and thinks in causal terms. It has concepts of polar extremes, parts and wholes, opposites and equivalents, and distinguishes between normal and abnormal mental states. Every homo sapiens culture known to history and ethnography distinguishes right from wrong and recognizes reciprocity, responsibility, and intention and so on for some 320 other characteristics. Anthropology's closure on human nature is highly significant for us. For if human beings share the same cosmic background, the same planetary source, a genetic code that differs minutely across the species, a universal deep linguistic grammar, and the psychological unity as demonstrated by these many cultural universals, it would be scientifically irresponsible to ignore the hypothesis that within the diversity of religions, there are important invariants. Which brings us to, oops, the sense in which religions are one. When Freud called religion a universal obsessional neurosis, <laughs> he at least got the universality part right. <laughs> but when none other than E.O. Wilson tells
tells us that the predisposition to religious belief is the most complex and powerful force in the human mind and in all probability an er in ineradicable part of human nature. There is little point in denying that as a species we still are, as apparently we already, uh, we apparently always have been, homo religiosus. Human beings are surely natural creatures, but they are just as surely prone to experience the natural as having a transcendent dimension or aspect. At the global court of human intelligence, the jury is still out as to whether that transcendent dimension really exists. So we'll bracket that issue. But human religions, that is, that is to say, human responses to a putative real, have appeared in no fewer than 100,000 forms. 90% of the world's current population engages in spiritual or religious practice of some sort. And there are as many as 9,900 distinct forms of religion extant on our globe today. But within that riot of religiosity, can we discern a universal spiritual grammar? My affirmative answer owes its deepest depth to the late English philosopher of religion, John Hick. In his Gifford lectures, published as an interpretation of religion, and a host of other books, Hick has produced the most lucid proposal for understanding both variants and invariants within human religious life that I know of in English. Professor Hick proposal, Professor Hick's, Professor Hick's proposal is that religions are conditioned human responses to a trans-categorical real. Sounds like a mouthful, but it's an important locution, uh, in my view, are conditioned human responses to a trans-categorical real that no set of human constructs can exhaust. He argues that human responses to the real vary because it is never, never known as it is in itself, but only as experienced and then interpreted through the neuronal, psychic, and cultural linguistic conditions of the human mind. Diagrammatically and over simply, the white light of the real impinges upon the human equipage to yield the rainbow of faith. Hick's case for a common spiritual grammar goes like this. The axial religions contain a common psychoethical program for personal wholeness and social coherence which can be propositionalized in four basic points. Each religion regards human life as an opportunity for a profound transition from the deluded or distorted character of our present existence in its untransformed condition to a condition that is limitlessly better. Here, Ed, uh, you've been talking about the importance of seeing the unity of religions in their, in their psychological process rather than in their doctrines. And Hick is on, on to that idea too, as we'll see from the rest of the four. The metaphors for this for uh, this are legion, from being lost to being found, from blindness to sight, from sleeping to waking, from bondage to liberation, from uh, from forgetting uh, Allah to remembering Allah. Each religion suggests that death is not the uh, each expressing the possibility of personal change away from natural self-centeredness the source of all greed, cruelty, and injustice, to a recentering in the real. Each religion suggests that death is not the end of the changes begun or continued in this life. Secondly, each religion teaches this opportunity exists because we are encompassed by a higher reality which from the human point of view is fundamentally gracious and which is to be sought or otherwise responded to. This reality is, of course, conceived in many forms and called by many names, ones I mentioned earlier and enough others to fill a small phone book. But what else could one expect from a receptive apparatus, the human brain, that can't smell what dogs smell, can't hear what bats hear, 
and within an electromagnetic spectrum that extends from cosmic rays as short as 10,000 millionths of an inch to radio waves as long as 18 miles, the human brain can pick up only those between 16 and 32 millionths of an inch. My point is that we now know that our great human brain is sensitive to only a very tiny band of the material world's total electromagnetic spectrum. What if we call God, what if what we call God is a spiritual spectrum that similarly exceeds the capacities of our neurological grid? No one would ever be aware of it transcendent as it is in itself, but only as it in impacts our particular human cognitive machinery and cultural conditioning. Thirdly, each religion proposes practices by which human beings can seek find accord with or otherwise respond to the real. We know the practices seem to fall into four major types, systematic cognitive reflection, emotive engagement, i.e. practices of devotion and gratitude, super derogatory service to our fellows, and finally, psychological cultivation of interiority. And finally, the great religions comprise a set of essentially common ethical ideals. This, of course, is worth a book or many books, but due to time constraints, I'll resist developing this point well known, uh, I'm sure, to you. Taken together, these points appear to disclose that from the evolutionary perspective, religions have been vast enabling contexts for the moral evolution of human beings. Which brings us to my close, a reflection on our emerging moral unity. Evolutionary psychologist Robert Wright has recently argued that humanity is moving erratically but steadily toward an expansion of its moral compass. Indeed, toward a moral universalism in theory and in practice. More and more of us, he says, are placing others of us within the circle of their moral consideration and thereby affirming the equal moral status of human beings. Time has drawn us, writes right, to the commonsensical sounding yet elusive moral truth that people everywhere are people just like us. Might we be in the midst of an evolutionary uptick in Homo sapiens moral quotient? We ask this outlandishly hopeful question because improbable emergences of some things out of their own absences, even if they require eons, are precisely what big history, back to that, has taught us to expect. Here's what I mean. From the Big Bang itself, to the emergence of matter, from pure radiation, to the de novo appearance of oligonucleotides, without which life would not have been possible, to the emergence of life out of its own absence, to the apparently sudden emergences of protein folds, major groups of viruses, principal lineages of prokaryotic, archaean bacteria, eukaryotic supergroups of animal phyla, to the emergence of human consciousness, and finally to an entirely new dimension of evolution, cultural evolution made possible by consciousness, big history teaches us that the universe is not a static cosmos, but a continuous and irreversible cosmogenesis, a recurrent and partially lawless birthing of a radically new. It seems that nothing transcends nature like nature herself. Up to now, religions have been humanity's primary vehicles for answering two of our biggest questions, namely, why be good? And how? Whether our old religions, which of course I respect greatly, whether our old religions will continue to help us on this score, or whether their penchant for literalism will finally subvert their ethical effectiveness is of course an ongoing global debate. But with or without the help of the old religions, insists scientist, atheist, complexity theorist Stuart Kaufman, and yet in his interestingly named book, Reinventing the Sacred, he says the task of finding a common spiritual, ethical, and moral space to span the globe could not be more urgent.
In my view, conferences and communities like the Dawn of Interspirituality are vanguards of the very effort Kaufman is calling for, and thus inspirational harbingers of a nobler human future. And that is why it's been an honor to address you this morning. Thank you. 